Thank you, Sultan. First, I'm going to apologize for keeping my sunglasses on. I'm going to use the excuse of being in the design district and talking about the future, but I just don't want to show my tired eyes. So. Yeah. Lights. Uh, thank you very much, Sultan, um, for that wonderful introduction. Um, um, so we're going to talk about the flying saucer. Um, and in trying to figure out uh, how exactly to approach the subject, um, I uh, decided that given that people from Dubai tend to be kind of chauvinistic towards Dubai and don't really make their way to Sharjah as often as they probably should, there's a good chance that quite a few people in the audience don't know what the flying saucer is. Here it is, all its glory. Um, so I figured I would start off with a, with a little text that I wrote that um, will introduce you guys to the flying saucer, both through personal anecdote, a little bit of uh, history and then maybe a little bit of speculative analysis at the end of it. It's very short, so bear with me. Uh, and then after that, uh, Sheikh Ahur and I will uh, engage in a conversation, um, try, try to flesh out maybe some of the uh, historical information that's come up since the Sharjah Art Foundation has taken over the space and uh, has uh, begun, uh, I guess, preserving it, restoring it, and working towards using it more actively with exhibitions uh, in the future. Um, uh, so first, my, my little statement. Uh, we, it's amazing how quickly things can uh, disappear uh, in, in a certain way. And um, the, um, the, the Flying Saucer memorabilia project that SAF has initiated is actually an attempt to kind of build up a visual archive around the, the building and the, the, uh, its uses and the, the role it played in like the imagination of the city. Um, but it's quite amazing how little exists online already. And so uh, the images that are going to be circulating behind are a selection of images that we have, uh, uh, that SAF has gathered from, um, from a couple of historical sources, one from, the one from the 80s, one from the 90s, uh, and then just a couple of images that I put together from Google Earth. Uh, sorry, that looked better on my computer screen. Um, <laughs> And, um, and then a couple of uh, uh, images of other buildings that are roughly contemporary or typologically similar uh, at the end. And these will just circulate uh, through as we speak. Um, so again, to introduce you to the flying source, also the, I should probably say a little bit about the, the title of the panel. It's called The Future Was a Roundabout, uh, and the reason for that is because until very recently, the flying saucer was located on a roundabout uh, that was called the flying saucer roundabout. Uh, the roundabout has since also disappeared. Um, and uh, in reflecting on the panel, I also thought that it might have been interesting if the panel had been called The Future Was Roundabout, and that's something we can come back uh, and talk about maybe a little bit later. Um, so a shallow dome sits atop the center of two stacked 16-point stars that make up the flying saucer's roof. The upper one is smaller and rotated slightly so that it points, so that its points align neatly with the valleys of the larger one below it. The points of the larger one protrude out over the smaller, almost circular, and largely glass structure underneath. The overhangs providing much needed shade from the harsh desert sun. While its alienness is unquestionable, a second, closer look reveals an unexpected relationship to the forms and geometries of Islamic architecture. It is, no doubt, an architectural curiosity, a fantastic, otherworldly building that makes little or no sense in relation to its surroundings. But it very much belongs in and to Sharjah, or at least in and to my Sharjah. In the fall of 1978, the then four-year-old me had just started school, and the Flying Saucer was an important and fond landmark. I don't know why I'm getting Sitting at the first of a, of a string of three roundabouts, I circled with my father uh, on the morning drive to school. But it also marked the crossroads between the routine of every day and the occasional extraordinary. A right at the roundabout led first to Al-Wahda Street, the fancier of Sharjah's two commercial thoroughfares, where the fast food pleasures of Hardee's, Pizza Hut, and Baskin Robbins lay, and eventually into Dubai with its fruit-filled land of leisure and its cool ice rinks. The accelerated rate of urban transformation experienced over the four decades since this country's foundation seems to produce a con condition where nostalgia, uh, which um, Shumon uh, beautifully reminded us uh, using uh, Svetlana Boehm's phrase, is a hypochondria of the heart, which might explain why I'm feeling so very clamped, uh, seems to produce a condition where nostalgia is intensified, becoming both an inevitable and necessary strategy of resistance to erasure compelling locals to find and hold on to bits of the past as anchors for memory and history. 
Given the nature of memory, it is usually either the intimate and familiar spaces of daily life or the larger than life, monuments or extra, uh, eccentricities like the flying saucer, structures that are unique and distinctive off and only off this landscape that have sufficient weight to sediment memory against the passing rage of time. Through my memories of it, I belong to the city I call home. Uh, while the exact dates the that the flying saucer was designed and built are still uncertain, we do know that the structure was finally occupied in 1978. Advertisements from the pages of the Khalij Times, featuring mysterious galactic swirls floating in black voids, built up anticipation for and finally announced its arrival on the 18th of December. With the flying saucer in quotes written in a hip, space agey, Jetson like font, the final adver advertisement proclaimed. Space age, uh, space age shopping comes to Sharjah. Uh, true to its alien, quote unquote, architecture, the new establishment brought a bit of cosmopolitan flair and European cafe chic to Sharjah's dusty desert landscape, promising, quote, authentic French and Italian food, freshly made pizza, spaghetti, ravioli, homemade French ice creams, pastries, croissants, freshly made, and homemade French ice cream, pastries, croissants, all freshly made at the patisserie. Responsible for producing those buttery, crusty delights was Gerard Raymond, a young French pastry chef plucked from balmy and beachy Saint-Tropez. Raymond left the, the Flying Saucer in 1981 to establish Café Gerard, one of the oldest chains of French cafes uh, in Dubai. Through the decades that followed, the Flying Saucer housed a variety of supermarkets, changing hands and brands every few years. Now somewhat hidden from you and inaccessible due to new flyovers and traffic patterns, it was most recently a Taza, a Saudi barbecue joint, a barbecue chicken joint, before being taken over by the Sharjah Art Foundation, who presented a site-specific installation by Hassan Khan there during Sharjah Biennial 12 earlier this year. Sharjah is a city filled with dome-top mosques and civic buildings, uh, but it seems to me that the Flying Saucer belongs to a small but distinctive architectural subset. Buildings where the dome, often shallow, is not merely a decorative add-on, but where its 360-degree symmetry determines the structure of the edifice it tops. The three interconnected flattened domes of the roughly contemporary Sharjah International Airport, their exterior and interior surfaces incised with a simple geometric pattern, follow this typology. The airport, built through the 1970s, opened on 1st January 1977. Now, depending on the date of the, final, uh, of the flying saucer's construction, this smaller structure may have served as a model for or have been inspired by the airport. This typology seems to have resurfaced recently in the recently opened Charger Center for Astronomy and Space Sciences, which actually opened earlier this year. Its gilded dome serving as the glorious sun anchoring a system of floating planets distributed through the institution's grounds and parking lot. Circular and, hence, circular and hence infinitely sided, these structures face no one direction, but open outwards to everyone. They are cosmopolitan and visionary. Though the, though the sample size is admittedly small, this type of architecture, at least in the context of Sharjah, seems to be reserved for portals, literal, literal and metaphorical, to the beyond, to far away and unfamiliar worlds and foods, to the heavens and to the future. So that was just uh, to give you guys a little feel of why I love the flying saucer. Um, and uh, now we'll uh, have a little conversation between me and Sheikh Kahur, who are of slightly different generations. I'm a little bit older. Um, about our memories of the building and then uh, maybe move on to issues of why, um, why you guys got a sense of why I thought it was an important building to preserve, but why you thought it was an interesting building to preserve. And also maybe a little bit of history that I didn't get to in, uh, in my presentation. Um, so yeah, uh, what are your earliest memories of the Flying Saucer? Well, um, I was born in 1980. I'm fine with that. But uh, my earliest memory was actually Lal Supermarket and buying something. It was very dark inside, I remember. And there, was a lot, there were a lot of knickknacks. But I didn't... And then another memory was in the 90s. It was fine fare, I think. So it kept changing hands in terms of supermarkets. Um, and we took over four years ago, but kept renting it out to Taza Chicken because we didn't have the funds to, uh, to renovate it or work on it because uh, we've been working on a lot of research uh, during this time at the Sharjah Art Foundation with old buildings, including the Khorfakan Cinema, the Kelba Ice Factory, Diba Ice Factory, and other little, little spaces. So for us, it's 
a matter of saving the building before developers come and destroy it or ruin it, but and taking our time in researching and archiving. Um, it's been uh, difficult trying to get information from people. It's mainly oral history. Um, I will say, actually, I did have a conversation with my father just to ask about the exact dates of when the flying saucer was built and whose idea it was to design a um, flying saucer in the middle of the city, let alone a supermarket. And he said, me. <laughs> and, and he said it was 1974. And, um, and I was a little per, uh, perplexed because I thought, why are you designing a supermarket? And I know that my father likes to design everything in Sharjah. There's a hint, and as Murtaza showed us, a lot of things are, have that Sharjah feel. Um, I'm still trying to get to the bottom of it. His reply was because I felt like it. So I'm still trying to, to get a response. But the idea we thought was, which we, we found out through research, not through my father, that there was a plan to have lots of flying saucer co-ops around the city. So this was supposed to be one of many. Uh, and when we decided to take over, um, he was actually very thrilled and was very upset that he built the flyover over it. But <laughs> this is what happens when... Uh, uh, when cities change, and I've explained many times how um, Sharjah looks, Sharjah is very nostalgic in, in a way because my father always talks about his nostalgia in his childhood and trying to save the heart of Sharjah, the old buildings, um, the Sukhshanasiya that's been currently uh, rebuilt. And for us, this is our history, you know, the children of the 80s late 70s, um, this is our nostalgia and our history and it has to be someone from our generation that is going to have to hold on to it and try to um, make something out of it. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the knowledge that it, might, it may or it, it was your father who designed it uh, kind of t transformed the space that might have been a space of, of, of commerce or exchange, like a mercantile space into a, a space that had like a, a certain kind of like... Uh, um, origin of, of, of kind of like royal or civic patronage, mm -hmm. which is kind of where, where I was going to yeah. with, by comparing it to other works that actually are civic institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I, I, uh, I wanted to come back to this idea um, that, that, that you said that your father is very interested in, in, in preserving, uh, because a lot of the more recent architecture in Sharjah, a lot of the more recent civic architecture in Sharjah, um, is kind of almost a neoclassical version of Islamic architecture. Uh, these buildings that have these uh, domes on top, uh, very rectangular looking. Uh, there's a whole string of them along the creek. Uh, but this, on the other hand, for the time period that it's built in, seems quite visionary. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I don't know if you've, in your conversations with him you've gotten any sense for what may have inspired a UFO. I do. In some of our research material, actually, we have uh, some paperwork on uh, UF UFO sightings in the Arab world in late 78. So there was one mention of Kuwait, one mention of Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. um, it's from a UFO magazine, but it was also um, mentioned in some uh, Arab newspapers. But I think at that time, I mean, my father is a playwright, and he, he's you know very big on theater. So I think maybe there was that influence. It was a different culture at the time. Even the Expo Center is quite kind of uh, playful in its architecture, a giant circus tent. Mm. You know, all this kind of stuff that was happening um, in terms of uh, architecture, design in the late 70s with the influence of, I don't know, the Jetsons or American TV and things like that, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, then can you speak a little bit about... Uh, uh, I'll speak a little bit more about uh, what you were talking about, about being part of this generation of the 70s and the 80s and, and buildings like these being uh, part of our heritage, uh, our nostalgia. Um, uh, maybe elaborate on that, on that a little bit more. Well, I feel well, the UAE is a country that's a new country and it's grown so quickly, it's modernized so quickly. So when I think of my father's generation and then my mother who's another generation and then us, that's kind of... There's a big change, you know, my father growing up uh, at a time when the heart of Sharjah was where he lived, you know, that's where he grew up. And then you know, with, the, with the oil boom and then us growing up in the 80s and 90s, there's not that much history to hold on to. It's very, it's, it's very scarce. Uh, it's good to, to, to focus on the future, but at the same time, you have to know where you're coming from. You know, you have to look at your past to know your future. 
And doing it through art and culture, uh, you can have a lot of debates and discussions on kind of a neutral ground. Uh, you can be creative, you can be um, facetious, you can, you, know, you can play around with it in many ways. Um, it's really been interesting finding a lot of these buildings because they're quickly disappearing. Mm -hmm. um, another amazing building that's kind of very futuristic in its uh, mural is the Horfa Khan Cinema. If nobody's been there, it's not that difficult to find. Horfa Khan's tiny. Um, but that's another project that we're working on. And a lot of these buildings weren't built with the best... Um, foundation, so it's very difficult to try and conserve and, and um, create something that would uh, benefit people now. Um, since we took over the flying saucer, I mean, since we used it in the biennial, it's really created uh, a lot of attention, especially from the older generation. And um, in a funny way, it's as if they forgot, they forgot that it existed when it was Taza Chicken and that we reminded them that this building still exists. And I mm -hmm. think that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about how you select these buildings uh, for preservation? Well, I, it, four years ago, I went on a bit of a, a mission, <laughs> not to Mars, but to, <laughs> but to Sharjah, and uh, to the central region, the eastern east coast. Um, I had a few people um, from the Department of Culture here who helped me out. Uh, to source a lot of these buildings and we were very lucky that over time we were able to um, put the buildings in our name the foundation um, but due to budget restraints we had to wait to, to use them for example the Kalba ice factory we used it as is uh, for Adrien Velarocha's installation at this biennial uh, the cinema we used in uh, two biennials ago uh, for Shazia Skander's uh, photographs, a photo shoot that she did there. We weren't allowed to actually use the buildings because of health and safety. Uh, we couldn't open it to the public. Um, and then the flying saucer with, with Hassan Khan, yeah. I think it's just kind of, uh, yeah, going on a, on a road trip and, and discovery mission and talking to people. The, the great thing is we have a good relationship with the town planning and with the heritage department. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sit around and discuss things and they say, oh, you know, there's this building and I think it's, it's empty uh, and it's not being used, it must be boarded up. You should take it, you should mm -hmm. do something with it. And the same thing happened when we got um, Sharjah radio station recently. Uh, because of the at international attention that the Kalba Ice Factory got, um, someone, um, well, my father, someone, my father said, I have a building from the 30s, and it's empty. And it used to be Sharjah radio station in the 70s. Uh, you know, go and see what it looks like. And we went, it was all boarded up. I think there was a sign that said to be demolished, but which wasn't happening. And uh, we recently went in there to clean up the building and uh, Sharjah TV and radio station, they have all the materials that are in there and they've been very helpful with the research. Um, and it's interesting to revive these little spaces, or some not so little, uh, at different parts of the Emirate because for me, the idea of Sharjah Art Foundation is not about the city of Sharjah, it's about the Emirate of Sharjah. Hmm. And it's, a, it's more important for me to do things in the central region and the eastern region. Uh, and of the same level, a lot of times you see programs that are of the best quality in the main city and then a dumbed down version for the little village. But for me, it's about really shifting things around, having people have to go to that side or to the middle. Like, you know, so people go to Madame, people go to Vaid mm -hmm. to see something, an, in, you know, an installation or an interesting building. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what, what's quite, uh, quite compelling about... Uh, about the, a, a building like the, the Flying Saucer, but even the airport but, and um, uh, even the Khorfa Khan Theater is how futuristic they still feel. I mean, they, they really embody, I think, a moment of, uh, of the future was, uh, a moment of, uh, of futureness that belongs maybe to the 70s, the 60s and the 70s, which isn't something that you see otherwise in Sharjah, which is why they stand out. I mean, a lot of the tall buildings in Sharjah kind of lack any, any character. So against that background, these, these buildings really really stand, stand out. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, about how it was used in the last biennial and how you're thinking about using it going forward? There's been a little addition put onto the, uh, to the building so that it isn't the, 
the, the perfect circle it used it started off as being. Yeah. Are you guys gonna possibly yeah. restore it? Yeah, we're working on it, but we have to do it in phases because we have a show opening in February, which is the UAE Pavilion that I curated for the Venice Biennial, which was commissioned by Sheikha Salama Foundation. Mm -hmm. It's coming to Sharjah first, then going to Abu Dhabi. And the reason we wanted to have it in the Flying Saucer is because it was of the same time period of uh, the history of the art scene. A lot of people refer to it in terms of stories. In our catalog, Abdullah Saadi kept referring in his diary saying, um, and then I went to the Flying Saucer to buy biscuits and milk. And then I went to the Flying Saucer to buy. And mm -hmm. it was something that was very repetitive and it was something that people did all the time. So I thought bringing this exhibition into a context of architecture um, also it's a little bit of a hidden message or an inside joke that the, the UAE art scene and the people of Sharjah, they know wh what I mean when I put it in the flying saucer, but maybe the international visitors don't really know and I don't really care. Yeah. Do you think you'll be able to restore it to its original form? Where's Muna? <laughs> Our architect Muna is here. We are working on it, at, um, not so much its original form. We are, it is gonna be like a 360, but we are working on making it more accessible. Now you have that flyover. We need to think about how cars come in. It's a little bit tricky, uh, but it's gonna happen in two phases. So phase one, and then uh, we don't know if the next uh, Sharjah Biennial curator, Christine, is going to want to use it, so then we can't touch it. And if she doesn't want to use it, then we'll restore it. Otherwise, we have to wait. That's another reason why things get delayed. For example, the Kalba Ice Factory was supposed to be going under um, construction and renovation, but I decided to stop it for Adrian's installation, which was a huge risk because mm -hmm. construction prices are going up uh, because of 2020 and uh, Doha World Cup. But I knew it was a risk that I wanted to take, and actually using it now really made us change our plans and ideas for the way it was going to be mm -hmm. renovated. So, you know, sometimes you have to take these risks, even though they take a long time. But, you know, talking about the future, the, whenever we do these projects, it is about the future. It's not about something that has to happen now, because it is about the future of the UAE, the future of the audience, the future of the art scene here, and preserving these spaces as well as we could. So research really is important, so, mm -hmm. yeah, so the future was. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I keep, uh, like when I, when I started preparing for this presentation and I actually, when I reached out to you for photographs, I was really hoping there would, some photographs would turn up that actually capture the sense of what these buildings were yeah. like when they were first built. Yeah. Because, I mean, we're talking about a, a Sharjah that was very young and a Dubai that was very young, where literally, uh, you know, my house is about two blocks away from the Sharjah, from the Flying Saucer. And when we first moved into that house in 1973, 74, uh, there were no uh, asphalt roads. Uh, my, my parents' cars would still get stuck on the dirt roads coming in from the, from the main road. So a building like this against that sort of landscape must have been quite stark. Yeah. And I have very vivid memories of visiting the Sharjah airport when it first opened up and having these three very like futuristic domes uh, just kind of like uh, sitting atop the, the desert landscape with its own undulating dunes. And so I just keep hoping that like somewhere, like photographs will turn up, that kind anyone, of capture. Yeah. yeah, if anybody out there does have if images have from that time period. Yeah. Uh, the, if you have images, the email is submit, S-U-B-M-I-T, at shrajaart.org. Um, so please email us. If you don't remember that, info at shrajaart.org is fine. So, uh, yeah, we'd be happy to hear people's stories, ask your grandparents, your parents, um, teachers. I think, yeah, anybody who has photographs, it's been really difficult to try and get a lot of information. Um, maybe a lot of, because a lot of these people are not online, but yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and, and that, that, uh, that precise qual quality of it kind of like really dominating, but also being completely out of whack with the landscape is quite lost by the, all the new development that kind of sets it back. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Does anybody in the audience have a question for either me or Sheikh Ahur? I can't see. I can't see anyone. No, no questions. Anyone? Antonia has a question. Oh. Yeah. 
I mean, I know that they research a lot of these buildings. I don't know if they are... Oh, uh, Antonia asked if the, you know, if the students at the American University of Sharjah, the architecture students, are influenced by this, by this type of architecture and if they're coming up with similar types of architecture. Muna, do you think you, you... Maybe Muna could answer this. I think she's in the audience somewhere over there. Because I haven't seen the works of the students at the university, the architecture students. Uh, I know that we hire a lot of the students <laughs> since they're uh, really amazing and brilliant at their jobs. But um, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of these buildings are uh, research material for them. Muna, are you there? Or Uh, the the architecture, uh, the, the building is a brutalist building, like it's a, the 60s style where it was actually exposed concrete and, uh, and exposed shell. And it's in later edition that there was this very colorful cladding that came especially wow. after the flyover. So the building is a very sort of 60s uh, uh, brut brutalist building, dating back to the 60s uh, British style. And I don't think the student in, in the School of Architecture, I mean, they recognize it his, historically. The, they recognize the style historically, but I'm not sure that it influences them. <laughs> I mean, to me, I see, um, I, I see a lot of uh, references, or maybe they're not references specifically to these buildings, but uh, a sort of similar logic, uh, this kind of idea of a low-slung low dome that kind of sits close to the ground and mimics the undulations of the of the desert landscape in a lot of uh, kind of like star architects uh, uh, yeah. proposals for uh, these large institutions. Like so, Zaha Hadid's yeah, like, new headquarters yeah, like for Like Zaha the, uh, Hadid or even the, the, the design for the Qatar National Museum. Uh, I mean, there's a, a, a similar logic to these as well. Uh, only these were working with significantly more uh, limited uh, architectural tools, like design tools. So. Yeah. Um, uh, is there any uh, other other questions? There was a hand up over here. No. Any other comments? Okay. So I think we're done. Oh, there is a question. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I can't see. We from can't up here. see anything over here. Sorry, I couldn't <laughs> see you at all. It's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to to ask one quick uh, quick thing um, there's a famous and important uh, Sharjah um, astronomy center uh, that determines basically when uh, Ramadan starts and with all these domes and things it seems like Sharjah was a, um, a capital of, of, of space inspiration uh, in a way so can you refer was this um, uh, just by chance or it, there's a story behind it, or maybe Star Wars starting in seventies. Yeah, I, mean, I can you. take a stab at that. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, Sharjah has a long history of aviation. Uh, it's it, there was an airport that was that's now in the middle of the city. Uh, it's uh, I think King Faisal Street now. Yeah. Uh, that used to be the old airport, um, that used to be the runway for the old airport, which was situated a little bit outside of the, uh, of the old city. Uh, that was run by the British, and it was one stop on the Imperial Airways routes from um, uh, London all the way to India. It was a very important stop. This was uh, st started up in the 1900, early, early to mid, early to... Early 1900s, and uh, we, there's, there's film footage dating as far back as the 1930s that kind of documents it. Uh, in terms of space exploration, I'm not so sure. I know that uh, Sheikh Sultan is very uh, civic and, uh, civically and educationally minded, so there's a lot of museums. So I think the, the Sharjah Planetarium especially, uh, which is the, the, the dome of the rock looking, yeah, this one, um, that has like the, the, the planets distributed through its grounds. Uh, and the the dome serves as the yeah. the sun it is you know part of his uh, his kind of like ongoing plan to create museums there and spaces an where people can both learn and uh, and be entertained. There's an older planetarium, and then this is the center for space sciences. Ah, okay. So I there's a there lot of that, and also the the film footage uh, is on YouTube of the Imperial Airways. It's called When Sharjah Ruled the Skies. That could have been nice for this talk. That title, yeah. 
So actually, Sharjah had an airport long before Dubai did. Um, had a, it, it w and I mean, that's, that's another reason why some of these buildings and preserving them is interesting, because they indicate uh, or they point to uh, earlier decades where, um, I don't want to say power relations, or maybe I do want to say power relations, were, were different between these neighboring emirates, where uh, Sharjah was uh, for a long time known as being the more cosmopolitan, more outwardly looking emirate. Uh, and then because it had this airport and because it had this long history of, uh, of kind of like foreign imperial forces going through uh, or colonial forces going through and then, uh, you know, things shift and then uh, Dubai kind of uh, uh, asserts itself, builds this very big air airport, establishes a free zone and kind of like dominates the area to a certain extent. Uh, so, I mean, f uh, for me, the buildings like the Flying Saucer and uh, all of these other um, structures kind of like index these earlier moments that are very quickly forgotten because the pace of development is so quick. And the pace of development in this country is almost always uh, uh, preceded with quite a bit of propaganda that mm. makes it even harder to kind of retain onto memory or, uh, or history. Um. Other questions? Comments? I hope people will come and see the Flying Saucer. We open on the 13th of February with the exhibition of the UAE Pavilion from Venice. If you need any information, sharjaarts.org. It's easy to find. I actually forgot one question I was yeah. going to ask you. Is, is this even a good space to show art? Flying Saucer? Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah? And, and if you stand... How are the acoustics? Amazing. If you stand right in the center, it has the best echo, which... Uh, I asked to keep because I think it could be an interesting space in terms of um, sound pieces, dance, acting, whatever, whatever uh, you need. But the dome is very is very echoey, but mm -hmm. in a very space agey way. It, it, you almost sound like a Martian. Mm -hmm. So you should come try it out. Cool. <laughs> Thank, you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.